The industry forced certain things on me, but because I did not know how to say no, I did not know how to ask questions. I was petrified. I was, I was intimidated. If I had known what it was going to be like, I never would have gone into it. It's much harder. The sacrifices are much more extensive. I thought that along with the uh, success and the money would come a husband and kids. I don't have either of those. Would you give up the money and success for the husband and kids? Forget it. I've also been burned in the past. Mm -hmm. Letting other people do that. Those who claim to have been the experts. And mm -hmm. I got burned. And I'm skeptical. That once you put your name on that piece of paper, you are bound and gagged. And I don't like that. Phyllis Hyman was a total legend in the music game. But it's crazy how folks forget about her. She really showed everyone that women don't have to take any crap from anyone. I like to be bound by my word, and those people who have worked with me over the years know that my word is my bond, and I don't go back on that. But man, her journey in the industry was no walk in the park. Behind all her success, there was a ton of ugly stuff going on that not many know about. Artists, unfortunately, are oftentimes concerned with being musically correct and having on the right clothes and the right makeup. and. That's not enough. Phyllis Hyman's voice in Living All Alone hits you right in the feels. It was one of those songs that just stuck with you. Her career? It spanned decades, but it feels like it was cut way too short. She was a shining light, no doubt, but she faced some serious personal and professional struggles. And being a black woman in the music biz, it was even tougher. Think about Whitney Houston, dealing with her own demons in the public eye. Phyllis went through similar battles and the industry didn't cut her any slack. A lot of emotional ups and downs, as I said earlier. I have begun the process of recovery, so to speak, mm -hmm. you know, just trying to feel better about myself. Her mental health took a hit and it's heartbreaking. She got caught up in a cycle of self-sabotage and self-doubt until it all got too heavy to bear. But despite all that, she left behind an incredible legacy of music. Yet it's like she's always forgotten when people talk about the greats like Whitney, Patti LaBelle, and Aretha Franklin. That's called extreme highs and extreme lows, and there is no middle for me. It has to be something that has to be worked on. Phyllis Linda Hyman was born on June 6, 1946, and she was the oldest of seven siblings. They all grew up down in the south side of Pittsburgh, chilling in St. Clair Village. Phyllis, though, she was something special from the get-go. Like, she had this killer voice, you know? She used to sing in the choir back at Carrick High School, and her music teacher, Dave Tambury, was blown away. He even hooked her up with some private voice lessons. After she graduated, she snagged this music scholarship to Robert Morris College, being the first one ever to get it. But after just one year, she was like, nah, I'm all about the music life, and dipped out of college to chase her dreams full time. During those years, Phyllis was all about the music scene, diving into different bands and groups. She formed this trio called Sound of Ebony, which was all about raising social consciousness through their music. Then she joined up with a jazz sextet called New Directions. This was where she really honed her skills. Although, let's be real, Phyllis could command attention just by walking into a room. Standing at a striking six feet tall, she had this presence about her, funny, bold, outgoing, and witty as can be. Her humor and banter were just as captivating as her singing. Once she hit the stage and opened her mouth to sing, forget about it. The audience was hooked even more. But Phyllis was always on the move. After her time with New Directions, she packed her bags and headed down to Miami to join another band called All The People. She was always chasing the next big musical adventure. After her stint with various bands, Phyllis decided to take the reins and form her very own band aptly named The PH Factor. They dabbled in jazz, funk, and Latin music, creating a unique sound that was all their own. Then, in 1975, she made the bold move to New York City with her band in tow. It could never be the same. Not like it was before. 
Settling in the bustling scene of the Big Apple, Phyllis and the PH Factory found themselves a regular gig at Russ Brown, a popular joint on the west side known for its tasty food and killer jazz vibes. And let me tell you, the audience there? Legendary. We're talking big names like Ashford and Simpson, Stevie Wonder, and even George Harrison popping in for a listen. One fateful night, jazz cat Richard Clay rolled through with none other than producer Norman Connors in tow. Connors was impressed. He promised Phyllis he'd have her in a recording studio within a week or two. Now, that's the kind of break any musician dreams of. Connors was true to his word, and before long he had Phyllis in the studio. He had her record a cover of the stylistics classic Betcha by Golly Wow, putting her own soulful spin on it. But that wasn't all. Phyllis also teamed up with Michael Henderson for a duet called We Both Need Each Other, which they nailed. <laughs> Seeing the success of her cover of Betcha by Golly Wow, Phyllis caught the attention of Buddha Records and they wasted no time signing her up. In 1977, she dropped her debut album simply titled Phyllis Hyman. And let me tell you, it was fire. One of the standout tracks, Loving You, Losing You, climbed all the way to number 32 on the R&B charts, solidifying Phyllis's place in the music scene. And she wasn't done yet. Another single from the album, No One Can Love You More, also made waves, peaking at number 58. It was clear that Phyllis was here to stay and her soulful voice was making waves in the industry. As Phyllis geared up for her second album, things got a bit rocky with her record label. Buddha Records got bought out by Arista Records, and it was a bit of a game changer. Her album Sing a Song dropped in 1978 just before the whole buyout mess, but unfortunately it didn't quite make the splash she hoped for. Enter Clive Davis, the big shot president of Arista Records. Now, Clive had a reputation for finding talent and shaping them into stars, but Phyllis wasn't about to be molded. She knew exactly who she was as an artist, and she wasn't about to compromise. Clive had other ideas. He saw potential for Phyllis to cross over into mainstream success, and he wasn't backing down. He took the reins for her third album, Somewhere in My Lifetime, and even brought in heavy hitter Barry Manilow to produce the title track. Somewhere in my Sure. The single reached a respectable number 12 on the R&B charts, but for Clive, that just was not cutting it. He was used to seeing his artists hitting the top 5 selling millions of records. Nothing less would do. And thus began a bit of a tug of war between artistic integrity and commercial success. For her fourth album, Clive Davis decided to switch things up by bringing in R&B producers James Matum and Reggie Lucas. The lead single, You Know How To Love Me, dropped in October 79 and made some serious waves, hitting number 12 on the R&B charts. And let me tell you, the album itself, it was a hit. Selling a whopping 400,000 copies, it was Phyllis's most successful record to date. Things were looking up for her personally too. She tied the knot with her longtime partner and producer Larry Alexander the year before. It seemed like everything was finally falling into place for the talented songstress. After the smash success of her fourth album, Phyllis was ready to be treated like the star she knew she was, but instead she found herself facing pushback from the label and Clive Davis himself. She speaks very briefly but very directly how Clive Davis aid her. Quote, Clive Davis taught me to never be afraid because I was so terrorized by him. Whether he meant to do it or not, I'll never know. But he sure taught me that if you try to terrorize me again, well, we can't say that on public radio. What I might do to someone who tries to hurt me like that again in this business, I'm not having it. I should be respected as I respect and I will not have someone try to ruin my spirit and ruin my career. If Clive Davis, if his plan was to destroy my career, it didn't work. It left her feeling frustrated and downright exhausted. To make matters worse, Arista started signing more female artists, including big names like Angela Bofill, Dionne Warwick, and Aretha Franklin. Suddenly, Phyllis felt like she was getting lost in the shuffle, and it wasn't just the industry stuff weighing on her. Phyllis also started experiencing mild bouts of depression. Mental health struggles were nothing new to her. The pressure of fame was starting to take its toll, but then a glimmer of hope appeared. While singing at a local jazz club, she caught the eye of the arranger for the musical Sophisticated Ladies, a celebration of Duke Ellington's work. Phyllis auditioned and snagged the role of Etta. Now, Clive wasn't too thrilled about her venturing into Broadway territory, but Phyllis Phyllis was not about to back down. She saw this as an opportunity to showcase her talents in a whole new way and connect with a fresh audience. It was a battle she was determined to win. I just can't let go. I can't say, here, girls, you got it. That's just mm -hmm. not my nature. I have also been burned in the past. 
Mm -hmm. Letting other people do that. Sophisticated ladies hit the Broadway scene with a bang on March 1st, 1981, lighting up the stage at the Lunt Fontan Theater. And what a cast it was. Alongside Phyllis, you had talents like Gregory Hines, Hinton Battle, and Judith Jameson, bringing Duke Ellington's magic to life. Phyllis absolutely shined in a role, earning rave reviews for her performance. She was even nominated for a Tony Award for Best Featured Actress in a Musical, and boy, did she deserve it. But that wasn't all. She also snagged the theater World Award for her standout work. The show was a hit, running for an impressive 22 months with a whopping 767 performances. It was a triumph for Phyllis, proving once again that she was a force to be reckoned with on any stage. In the midst of her Broadway triumph, Phyllis didn't miss a beat. She dropped her fifth album, and it was like a breath of fresh air for her. Clive Davis brought back Norman Connors for this one, and the result was pure gold. The album, titled Can't We Fall In Love Again, hit its peak at number 12, and the title track, a duet with Michael Henderson, even reached number 9 on the R&B charts. Phyllis's first top 10 hit. It was a momentous achievement for her, no doubt. But even amidst her success, Phyllis was still feeling dissatisfied with the direction her label wanted to take. There was just so much pressure to churn out commercial hits, and it often led to clashes over creative control. Phyllis wanted to work with musicians and producers of her choosing, while Davis was all about bringing in hitmakers. It was a constant tug of war, with Phyllis fighting for her artistic vision every step of the way. And as she described it, there is a deep connection between part of my loneliness with my music if you listen to some of the words in my songs. I sing about a lot of pain, which is something I know a lot about. After nearly a decade together, Phyllis made the tough decision to divorce Larry Alexander in 82. Um, why did it end? I think we just grew apart. You know, we, we, he went one way and I went another. And Not only was she losing her partner, but also her manager and producer. It was a tough blow for Phyllis, but she knew she had to keep pushing forward. With her Broadway run behind her and her personal life in flux, Phyllis was eager to get back into the studio. Little did she know, more troubles were on the horizon. Her sixth studio album turned out to be a complete disaster, highlighting just out of touch Arista was with Phyllis Hyman. It's hard, and I'm told by other women, uh, executive women, that they have a hard time as well. I don't know if that's true or not, but um, I, can, I can testify to the fact that it is definitely um, not easy. Clive Davis brought in producer Narada Michael Walden along with a slew of others resulting in a mishmash of conflicting genres that just didn't click. The lead single, Riding the Tiger, barely made a blip on the radar, reaching only number 30 on the R&B charts. And the album itself, titled Goddess of Love, peaked at a lackluster number 20. We got some love. It was clear that this was Phyllis's weakest album yet, and it only drove a bigger wedge between her and Arista. The frustration and disappointment were palpable, and it seemed like there was no end in sight to the battles over her artistic direction. Amidst the turmoil of her music career, Phyllis managed to find a glimmer of hope. She brought on managers Glenda Garcia and Sidney Francis to help navigate the stormy waters. At the time, her business affairs were in disarray, and Phyllis was yearning for a change in her life. As the battles between Clive and Phyllis raged on behind the scenes, it became increasingly clear that they were at odds with each other. Phyllis resisted Clive's attempts to mold her into his vision of the next big thing. After all, she had spent years honing her craft and knew exactly who she was as an artist, but Clive couldn't seem to see the talent right in front of him. He failed to understand the deep connection R&B and jazz had to the black community, instead opting to whitewash his black artists. Uh, and then 30 came, 35 came, and I begun to have clues about who I was, who I wanted to be, and I liked that. Phyllis's new managers, Glenda and Sydney, tried their best to mend the fractured relationship between her and Clive. However, Clive had set his sights on a new focus, a rising star named Whitney Houston. Arista made the heartbreaking decision to drop Phyllis from her record deal, leaving her to navigate an uncertain future in the music industry. Losing the opportunity to play Shug Avery in The Color Purple was yet another blow to Phyllis's career. During the table read, which boasted a star-studded cast including Oprah, Whoopi Goldberg, Danny Glover, and director Steven Spielberg, Phyllis's attitude rubbed everyone the wrong way. She tried to take control of the meeting, telling others what to do, and it left a sour taste in everyone's mouth. The cast and director couldn't imagine dealing with her behavior throughout five months of filming. For Phyllis, this was devastating. It felt like another cycle of self-sabotage followed by disappointment adding to the weight on her shoulders. I'm told by other women, uh, executive women, that they have a hard time as well. I don't know if that's true or not, but... Um... I can, I can testify to the fact that it is definitely 
um, not easy for me. Despite the disappointments she faced, Phyllis remained determined to find her place in the music industry. She was wary of signing another record deal after her experiences with Arista. Then, along came Philadelphia International Records, a label with a deep understanding of the soulful sound Phyllis embodied. Founded by Kenny Gamble and Leon Huff in 71, it was renowned as the epitome of the sound of Philadelphia. Phyllis's journey was fraught with more than just the typical challenges of the music industry. Ten years before, she was diagnosed with bipolar disorder, a condition that added another layer of complexity to her life. But that wasn't all she was grappling with. Her relationship with food was unhealthy, leading to fluctuations in her weight food became a way to numb the pain she was feeling. Phyllis also turned to D's using A and C to cope with her struggles. Depression weighed heavily on her, sometimes making it difficult for her to even get out of bed. These issues, coupled with her struggles in maintaining relationships, led her down a dark path. That was very painful for me. Um, so when I came out to do the tune, we had a very difficult time recording. Of course, Marty was thrilled to see me crying and in all this pain. Despite these obstacles, Phyllis longed for a way to overcome her pain. In 1986, she made the brave decision to enter rehab. It was a turning point for her, and by the time she completed her program, she emerged with a newfound sense of optimism. Phyllis embarked on a tour, captivating audiences in every city she visited. She was a true performer, exuding charm, spontaneity, and beauty on stage. Each night, she poured her heart and soul into her performances, endearing herself to all who had the pleasure of witnessing the incredible talent of Miss Phyllis Hyman. Britain Simpson, Stevie Wonder, George Harrison from The Beatles, George Benson, they were all in this tiny club watching me sing, and I was in shock. I couldn't believe. Behind the scenes, cracks began to appear in Phyllis's facade. She stopped taking her medication for bipolar disorder because she didn't like how it made her feel, fearing it would stifle her creativity. Instead, she turned back to using C and A, while also abusing food and seeking solace in S to numb her pain. Phyllis found herself in relationships with both men and women, each one driving her further into despair, especially when she couldn't fully be with someone she loved. The weight of it all became unbearable for Phyllis. In June of 1990, while at her home, she attempted to take her own life with sleeping pills. This was not her first attempt. She had tried the year before as well. Thankfully, her friends found her in time and called 911, saving her from the brink. The following year in January, Phyllis entered a rehab facility in Naples, Florida to treat addiction for food and D's. She released her seventh album, Prime of My Life, on June 11, 1991. Phyllis's sobriety didn't last long. Hyman gained weight and began to battle with self-esteem. The music industry is very fat-phobic, ageist, and racist. Phyllis always felt pressure about her body and look. Even though she was beautiful and talented, the industry made her feel worthless and undeserving of success. Her finances were in shambles due to cavalier spending. Her demeanor worried friends. On June 30th, 1995, Phyllis was in New York. She was preparing for a concert with the Whispers at the Apollo Theater. She instructed her assistants to wake her up for the sound check. When they arrived at the apartment, the chain lock was on the door. They broke down the door, only to find Phyllis in bed unconscious. She was rushed to the hospital. This time, it was too late. Hyman left a note behind. The note said, quote, I'm tired. I'm tired. Those of you that I love, you know who you are. May God bless you. She was a week away from her 46th birthday. One of her fans wrote, quote, People assume and speculate, but this woman was beyond this world, beyond her time. So beautiful, so elegant, fashion forward, classy, and intelligent. Love that she loved her black people the way she did. Miss you, girl. Another one added, quote, Once you know Phyllis, she stays in your heart forever and you always go back and listen to her timeless music over and over. Love you, Phyllis. Phyllis Hyman died not knowing how loved she truly was. Make no mistake, she fought hard to overcome her demons. In the end, she truly felt this was the only way out. After years of suffering and carrying on, Hyman longed for love professionally and personally. 